Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jayatri Das, Chief Bioscientist here at the Franklin Institute. Thanks for joining me again for one of our COVID updates where we talk about the science uh, and all of your questions about the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. I'm honored to be joined today by Dr. Benjamin Abramoff from the Penn COVID-19 Recovery Clinic. And we're gonna talk about his experience with working with patients who are in the process of recovering from COVID-19 and what that means on a long-term basis. But before we jump into that conversation, Ben, I think we have to talk about the exciting news that is all over the headlines today, which is the exciting data emerging about the Pfizer vaccine. So before we talk about what, you know, what that means, where we are right now, let me just review a little bit about what we know about the science of this vaccine. So this is a vaccine that is what we've talked about on some, some of our previous discussions is an mRNA vaccine. So that means this is actually genetic material that it would be injected into uh, a person and then it, it includes the information for the body to then produce its own version of one component of the virus. And then the body can then produce an immune response to that component. So what was really exciting today is, I think, is the numbers about you know, how, uh, how effective it is. Uh, and Ben, let me ask you, you know, what, what's your reaction to the news? Yeah, I think it's really great. I think we all kind of had a sense that there was a lot of good efforts being put into uh, making a vaccine and getting the vaccine uh, out to the public. Uh, I was actually a little bit surprised that, you know, this kind of came out of nowhere. I thought there'd be a little bit more, at least in my kind of world, build up in terms of this is about to come out or we're seeing promising results, but it seems a little, a little bit to have gone from zero to a hundred, which is great, you know, from yeah. not really, you know, hearing things were in the works that, hey, this is really on the cusp. Uh, and maybe, you know, even by the end of the year, having something uh, produced, I think that's really exciting. And I think the numbers that they're saying, if they can be verified with, you know, peer reviewed science and everything, I think, you know, that, that's really exciting. Yeah, and I've, I've been reading a little bit about the backstory because I think, you know, you know, you're not alone in that in that reaction. And on one of our earlier conversations, we've talked about how, you know, through this research and development uh, process, these vaccine developers are, you know, have created these interim time points at which they want to check in on how on how they're doing. And that depends on how many people in their participant pool have contracted COVID-19. Uh, and so what, you know, what this time point is, is actually an interim time point. So the study is not yet complete. Um, what they did was look at, um, look at their target uh, part, set of participants, and they found that 94 people in their data set had already contracted COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to look then at, of those 94 people, how many people are in the placebo group that didn't get the vaccine versus how many people did. And the fact that we're seeing um, percentages that it's 90% effective means that of those 95, 94 people that you know, probably only nine or, you know, nine or fewer were in the vaccine group. So that's what it means to have that 90% um, effective rate. Uh, you know, I take away a couple of other really positive notes from the data that we've gotten today. One is that, you know, Pfizer and um, BioNTech, which are the two companies that are working together on this vaccine, um, their mRNA vaccine was targeted towards the spike protein, which, you know, we've all seen that, the, you know, that image of the, of the coronavirus with the protein sticking out of the surface of it, um, that, that, you know, that surface protein is a spike protein. And there are a lot of vaccine companies that are, are using that as a target of their vaccine. Um, so that's exciting that it seems like um, that is an effective target. So if it works for this vaccine, it might work for a lot of other ones as well. And the second piece is that, you know, there hasn't been an mRNA vaccine, you know, that's been approved before. So, you know, it, it, it's promising for this particular approach to the vaccine. So let's, um, we've got a question, and I think this is a really excellent question. So how can you possibly assert efficacy without having time pass by to substantiate that? So it seems like this is when the actual long-term testing and observation would kick in. 
Do you want to take a shot at yeah, answering that so, question? So I think, you know, we might not be able to say anything about uh, long-term efficacy. So, you know, like with the flu vaccine, the flu changes so much on a year-to-year -year basis that that's why you have to have an annual flu vaccine. It's not one that you can take one time. I, I think what they're seeing, the way they're analyzing this is they're saying, well, we have 100 patients and or 100 participants in the study. And let's say, and these are all you know, example numbers, 90 get COVID who did not have the vaccine and 10 got it who did get the vaccine. And we gave the vaccine to the same amount of people in both groups that would suggest that to some extent that COVID vaccine is very uh, powerful and very effective. Right. And I think that's the key point is that what we know now is the short term effectiveness of preventing immediate infection. Um, like you said, Ben, we don't know anything about yet how long that protection lasts. Um, and, you know, some other data that we don't know yet, um, we haven't gotten the safety data on these participants yet. Um, we know that the FDA is requiring at least a two month follow up on half of the participants in the study before they're willing to consider um, any type of approval. Um, so that's, that's another important piece of data that we're still waiting for. And then I think another aspect of it that relates to this question is, so what this data tells us is like, do people get it or they don't get it? <laughs> um, but there's that middle ground too, um, that does it prevent more severe disease? So even if you have the vaccine and you contract the disease, does it at least help you prevent getting a really serious case of the disease? So it's not entirely black or white in terms of the outcomes that we're looking at, um, but so far what we know is promising, but, it's, but it is, as you, as you described, been very limited in its scope. And, and it's, those are similar questions that we have with people who are naturally infected uh, with COVID and then they're in kind of their post-COVID period. We don't know long-term what happens to their antibody response and their chances of getting infected. And if they do get infected again, would they still have the same uh, seriousness or same intensity of infection the second time as the first time? Um, so those are questions that are also outstanding. We know some, we know in, you know, in the last 10 months, 12 months, but we don't know long-term, obviously. Right. So, so all of these continue to be monitored, um, you know, even after, you know, a vaccine might be approved by the FDA, these patients are continuing to be followed, right? It's not like, okay, we, 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 we got it out there to the public, we're done. <laughs> right. uh, so, so, you know, I want to, you know, close this, you know, and, and please do send us more of your questions um, if you have any, um, but that, what, what are the next steps here? And certainly we have to wait for some of this additional data to come in. Right now, all, all, we're, all we're working off today is a press release. Um, so we, we're waiting for the additional data to be, to, be, um, to be published and reviewed by other scientists, to then be reviewed by the Vaccine Advisory Board of the FDA before they make a decision about whether to authorize uh, emergency use of this. And then of course, there's the challenges of getting out there. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the U.S. government has an agreement with Pfizer for the first hundred million doses of it, but there are questions about how to effectively and equitably get the vaccine to the people who need it most. All right, we've got a couple of questions coming in, so let's tackle these. Um, so what do we know about people getting COVID multiple times? Uh, so we know it's very, very, very rare if it ever happens, uh, which is separate from people who have had COVID and they're in the kind of recovery period and they say, oh, I was sick and then I was feeling better and I started feeling worse again, uh, which I think is a different process, but looking at kind of PCR evident uh, confirmed infections, there have been maybe a handful of cases that are in kind of the case report uh, side of things. It's not a common phenomenon. All right. And then what do, we, what do we know about the actual ingredients in the vaccine, such as adju adjuvants and other um, delivery you know, ingredients? I don't know anything about that. I don't either. Um, you know, I think it seems like the, you know, what, what are potential shortcuts that might influence the safety? I think what we do know is from the earlier trials that were done um, in terms of safety that 
the, the side effects here are comparable to other vaccines. So they found, you know, some pain at the injection site, maybe low grade fever. Um, these are to be expected, um, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, certainly, again, that ongoing monitoring is to track potential side effects. But uh, and and certainly this this two month uh, safety window is essential for deciding whether it's safe enough to move forward. Um, but that being said, there have not been any you know alarm bells that have gone off around the safety of this um, this particular vaccine yet. Um, so that's promising. Um, another question is in terms of what kind of placebo it was tested against, and I. My memory is not 100% on this because different companies have used different comparisons for placebo. Uh, I know some of them have used, you know, just a, a mock injection, whereas others have tested against different vaccines. Do you do you know offhand know the case, kind of placebo that they yeah, use here? I, I, I'm trying to remember if I read it, um, but I, I don't. Uh, yeah, sure. we can we can follow up in the comments, um, yeah. you know, in terms of what kind of placebo. Uh, that being said, what we do know about the current formulation of the vaccine is that you know is actually one of the biggest challenges that that we're looking at in terms of getting this out, you know, in a widespread manner. Which is this particular formulation requires um, two doses, which is common to many of the vaccines in development, but it also requires storage at ultra cold temperatures like like negative 70 degrees Celsius. So that is definitely a constraint in terms of how how widely we can distribute this. And that's an area of improvement. And often it's those additional um, ingredients that are included for stability that will continue to be improved um, so that you know, we can we can make the storage um, and transport uh, um, conditions a little bit more stable to be able to make the delivery easier. And I wouldn't be surprised in six months or eight months if there's not three or four different vaccines kind of out there on the market that are competing with one another. That's right. You know, we know that, you know, obviously the more vaccines we've got, you know, options, <laughs> the better. Because yeah. we also don't know, um, we don't know, and among the other data that we don't know yet is how effective this vaccine might be in different age groups, for instance. Um, we know that you know older people often have more compromised immune systems, and so you can't always predict how a vaccine um, will uh, will act in you know different ages. That said, I know you know I've we've seen some of the protocols that the that these companies are using, and everyone's making an effort to include older participants, uh, people from different ethnicities, to make sure that you know we're testing this in um, you know to get as much data as possible. Um, certainly the one, the one group that has not been included so far is children. Um, so that is, that is definitely an outstanding question. So what, are, what do you see moving forward, you know, in the next month, two months, six months? In terms of the, the vac vaccine? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I know that Penn Medicine has sent us an email today uh, saying that, uh, we're looking at getting a vaccine by the end of the year. So I don't know if they have other information and they're deciding on kind of how to dispense that in the most uh, effective way throughout the health system to you know, doctors, nurses, staff, um, so that the most vulnerable and most impacted people uh, will be the first ones to get the, the vaccine. Uh, but they, they kind of have in their mind that they'll get part of that first batch that comes out. Um, they also mentioned in that email at least that it would be optional at first. So I thought that was somewhat interesting given that no other you know vaccines that we have are optional. Um, so we'll see kind of where that goes as the evidence mounts and everything. But uh, it seems like they're ready to kind of you know jump on it. And I think they'll probably go to those high risk populations first and then kind of spread out to the, to the general pub public. Yeah, I wanna follow up on two points that you said. And you yeah. know, one is from a, an, an audience question here is, you know, I'll, this what we know about COVID has been changing constantly as, as we learn more. Um, what do we know now for which groups seem to be most at risk? Well, certainly the elderly are, you know, greater than 65, high risk. You know, those are the patients that are the individuals that if it gets into the wrong setting can really spread very quickly and cause lots of really significant mortality. Uh, I think 
also those with comorbid illnesses, so diabetes, heart disease, chronic lung disease, those were also individuals at very high risk of complications related to COVID. That being said, I always like to make the caveat that I have seen several, many patients that are younger who've had pretty significant either acute illnesses or kind of post-recovery courses. And I think that that still seems to be, you know, one of the, one of the mysteries of, of this disease about, you know, what, why, why some people, you know, who don't apparently have any of these other risk factors are still, you know, so seriously affected. And I think there's genetic causes. I think there's been some really interesting early research and don't ask me to go into the specifics of it. That suggests that certain genetic profiles have higher risk of, uh, complications are becoming sick with it than people with other, you know, genetic profiles. They've even done some twin studies looking at that. So. Oh, interesting. Um, and then the final factor that I do want to mention is also that there are a whole set of social factors overlaid on top of biological factors <laughs> that put different communities at risk in terms of, you know, who are frontline workers and, you know, who has access to healthcare and, and what that means in terms of exposure risk as well. Yeah. Um, and and, and we, we see this disease, you know, really hitting communities of color, you know, mm -hmm. very hard. Um, so uh, I mentioned that in terms of all of the factors that were being considered, uh, the, the National Academy of Sciences uh, just last month released a framework for, you know, a potential equitable allocation of a vaccine mm -hmm. when it comes out. So thinking about, you know, who are these high risk groups and how do we make sure that the vaccine gets to them first? Um, and certainly, you know, healthcare workers are are high up <laughs> on, on the priority list. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, I think once you know, the kind of technology is there, ramping it up with as much, you know, hopefully with as much money and support that's behind it, hopefully it'll ramp up fairly quickly. Uh, but it does sound like there's some technical limitations to doing that. So stay tuned. <laughs> keep, keep sending us your questions about the vaccine. Um, but let's switch gears, Ben, now. Um, to talk about some of the work that you're doing uh, in terms of working with patients who are, are, are dealing with recovery from this. Um, and your specialty is in physical medicine and rehabilitation, which, you know, one doesn't immediately associate with, you know, a respiratory illness. Yeah. Um, can you tell us more about, you know, your field more broadly before we kind of dig into how, you know, your current work with the disease? Sure. So physical medicine and rehabilitation is a pretty broad field. Uh, but you can kind of classify it in two groups. One is kind of the MSK side, musculoskeletal side, which is things like sports medicine, pain, uh, so things like that, spine injuries. Uh, the other side is more the neuro rehab, uh, which is kind of the boat that I fall into. Uh, and that looks at things like brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, CP, things like that, spina bifida. And the goal kind of throughout this is how do we get people to maximize function? So they're able to uh, do kind of everything they want to do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, whether that's with adaptive equipment, whether that's with your medications. Um, so my background is actually, I did a fellowship in spinal cord injury medicine. Uh, so that's people who are per, often paraplegic or tetraplegic due to injuries to the spinal cord. Uh, and kind of where the overlap, overlap comes in with COVID is that in the patients that we see in physiatry have a lot of multidisciplinary, multi-organ system issues. Uh, so we need to have big teams with therapy, pulmonology, neurology, urology. And th that type of framework was one that at Penn, we wanted to apply to kind of our post-COVID patients because we knew and we saw that they were coming in with kind of these multidisciplinary, multi-organ system issues. And in order to get them to the right people and get them to the right treatments, uh, rehab felt like a, a natural kind of home for them. That's really interesting. So really thinking about the whole body effects of, of you know, the aftermath yeah. of, of the infection. Uh, so, you know, one question is that, that, that came in here is for the patients that you're seeing, what treatments have, you know, have many of them undergone already? Yeah. So I think that's a really good question because I think there's, one, one limitation is we don't know a lot. We don't have a lot of research that uh, this works or that works. A lot of that depends on what symptoms they're having and where their kind of biggest deficits are. Uh, so somebody who's having a lot of neurologic deficits, we might treat 
as very differently than somebody who's having a lot of pulmonary deficits. I think the one overarching therapy that's been helpful for a lot of our patients, uh, particularly those patients that have some of the most common uh, post-COVID symptoms, loss of energy, fatigue, loss of endurance, pain, uh, concerns about kind of autonomic uh, functioning while doing activities, so pancardia, things like that, is getting them into a structured therapy program. So lots of, there's been a little bit of debate within the post-COVID world is do we want to push our patients to kind of become more active in a structured manner? And what we're seeing in our clinic is, is it can be very helpful to get them into our therapy program. And we have a very specific therapy program that we've created for post-COVID patients that focuses on building endurance and strengthening in a very stepwise fashion, um, starting at very low levels, even things like passive stretching, uh, breathing exercises, which is a major component of all the therapy that we're doing, uh, and building that slowly with time with the idea of le it leads to any type of post-exertional malaise, feeling worse after exercising, taking that step back. Uh, and we've noticed that that process can be very helpful for a lot of our patients. Um, so that's one of the things that we're learning and doing a lot on uh, kind of a global uh, patient perspective. Otherwise, a lot of it is very symptom-based. So depending on whether it's chronic cough, whether it's loss of taste and smell, whether it's the brain fog that a lot of patients uh, report, based on what that symptom is, we kind of address that specifically. So we, you know, I've seen, you know, I've seen stories about what uh, doctors are calling long haul patients. Mm -hmm. What defines a long haul patient? And, you know, what is the range of recovery time that we're looking at? So there's no real one universal definition that's come up. Some papers and some authors have suggested a definition of three months or 12 weeks um, to recover. And beyond that, that would be considered long haul. And another thing that would be kind of classified as having multi-organ um, system complaints, lots of names for the condition, post-COVID, post-acute COVID, long COVID syndrome, long hauler. So there's a lot of different names for kind of the same thing, um, but there's not one, I guess, universal definition. I think one thing to keep in mind is that it's not really unexpected within like two, three weeks after coming down with COVID to still have lingering effects. Uh, I think that's kind of within the nor normal range. It's only after you get, you know, a couple months out or we're not making continued is, continuous improvement that uh, becomes more of a concern for kind of a, a long hauler syndrome. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is it's very dependent on how sick you were initially. So somebody who was in the ICU on a ventilator for a month and had ECMO, we know that those patients from other illnesses like pneumonia and things like that they're going to have a very prolonged recovery. And so one thing that we're trying to do within our field is kind of define what, are all these patients the same thing? Or are people who have long COVID or long post-COVID syndrome, are they, do they have different phenotypes? Do we have to look to identify and classify these phenotypes uh, so that they get appropriate treatment? So we don't want to make the mistake of bundling all the patients together just because they kind of had COVID or they look somewhat similar on the outside. Right, and, and by phenotypes, you mean sort of like a category of, of, of conditions or category of severity, something like yeah. that. Yeah, the picture of what they look like right. physiologically. So I think that's a really, really relevant thing to talk about for, you know, with respect to a question that we've gotten from the audience that kind of ties these two parts of our conversation together. You know, asking about, you know, what is the risk, risk to benefit ratio? And, you know, how likely are we to get this and get get terribly sick versus how safe or effective the vaccine might be. And I think one of the, you know, one of the, the pieces that the, you know, that we haven't necessarily been good about, um, you know, finding some nuance in, and this is where, you know, this is one of the reasons that I wanted to bring you in to talk with us today is, is all of these shades of gray is that, you know, when we talk about risk benefit, it's not just do you do you recover in three weeks or do you die? Right, right, and but that those are come up some of the statistics that we're seeing. So, can you help us understand sort of like the full range of effects in terms of thinking about risk? Yeah, so, yeah. So, the the number of patients at let's say three months that continue to have symptoms is very varied depending on what research 
you look at and what you know studies you're looking at, I think on the low end, it's probably about 10% that will continue to have symptoms months out from their initial infection. Uh, you know, in terms of what those symptoms look like, it can be mild. It could be, you know, I still have a little bit of fatigue. I'm not really uh, back to my full level of activities. Playing sports is really hard. I get short of breath when, I, when I'm doing track. I also have other patients who, you know, can't really get back to work, can't function. Um, they're kind of housebound. Uh, they try to walk half a, block, half a mile and they're getting completely short of breath. So I think it's really important to recognize that there is that spectrum that you kind of identified. And I think there is starting to be more awareness of it as uh, just as time goes on and as these patients, um, you know, become more prevalent. And, you know, if you think about kind of death rates versus the rate of people who will have lingering effects, that lingering effect cohort will be, if we look at this research, will likely be in the millions. Uh, so it's something that we have to really pay attention to and really focus on how do we best treat those patients and identify them uh, and why they have these symptoms. Um, and it's challenging because I think a lot of people want, obviously naturally want a reason and an answer for, hey, you have chronic fatigue syndrome, you have autonomic dysregulation. And, and I'm very hesitant to say that without having more evidence to say that, yes, you have this kind of disease or sim symptom, or is this something completely different? Right, and we just don't know enough yet about how the after effects of COVID either relate to or don't relate to some of these other chronic syndromes that, we, that yeah. we're more familiar with. Which can also be in the post-viral uh, syndrome. One thing that is for the sickest patients uh, who have been in the ICU, there is a lot of kind of awareness and knowledge of post-ICU syndrome and kind of the physical, cognitive, and psychological effects of something along those lines. Um, so I think we do have a little bit more understanding on that side of things, but for the, these patients who had mild illnesses, who are not hospitalized, who continue to have lingering effects, I think that's a really outstanding question that a lot more work has to go into. And luckily there's lots of people out there who are starting to look into that. Right. But ultimately, like all of these, um, these statistics are things to factor in when we think about risk. Um, you know, the, our, our, uh, the question from the audience, you know, mentioned, you know, the, the, um, the severe side effects that, you know, that emerged during a few of the vaccine trials. Um, obviously, those have been investigated and, and, you know, to my knowledge, have, have, um, have been resolved as not related to the vaccine development. But when we think about, you know, just the, the sheer numbers of people who are getting infected right now as case counts are going up, you know, that you mentioned that 10 per, if it's 10%, of people who have these long-term fact, you know, long-term effects, you know, that 10% is going to increase along with the case counts. Yeah, and I and I think that's you know really important to know because you know if we don't have widespread utilization of the vaccine, then you don't get very far in terms of the decreases in efficacy when you don't have the herd immunity of a lot of people having the vaccine, and you know. It just increases the risk of people getting infected. And I think it's a job of us in medicine and also uh, the scientific leadership to kind of make the case, you know, if they think the vaccine is that, that risk benefit uh, ratio, the benefit outweighs the risk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't know enough about the vaccine and really it's not my area of expertise to kind of, you know, weigh those things together. And I think you have to, you know, look at the real experts in this and really trust kind of what they're, saying because uh, I know there's a lot of initial skepticism about vaccines out there globally and then when you add in kind of the political environment and the kind of the speed in which this vaccine you know, came into development I think there's going to be a lot of challenges to people widely accepting the, the vaccine. I think and that's I'm, right I mean that's certainly one of the reasons why you know we've been trying to maybe like you know open up the hood yeah. <laughs> you know, as as you know as this process you know progresses um, we've been trying to help explain, you know, help people understand what's happening at every, at every step of the way, um, so that we have a collective understanding of of how these get developed and what are the trade offs that we're making and what are the considerations that are going in. Because uh, I think you know one thing that we know is that, as you said, that for a vaccine to really make a difference, people have to have confidence in it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, and certainly, you know, the more information people have about the vaccine and, and how it was developed can, can only help, um, yeah. you know, with, with that confidence. So let me circle back um, a little bit to, to your work in, in maybe a very practical level. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if somebody is recover has, has, you know, has gotten COVID and, and is in that state of recovery, when would you, when would you, might you recommend that they come to you? I, I think it always makes sense to see your primary care physician first, you know, and see if there's easy answers to the questions. I think often if, you know, you're seeing people and you don't feel like you're getting kind of the answers that you're looking for. Uh, we have people kind of here at Penn who have an interest in COVID. So like the pulmonologists that you, you would see kind of are the pulmonologists that have a focus, some of them have a focus in COVID uh, and same with cardiology and other fields. So I do think uh, there's some benefit to that. I think, you know, again, a couple months is kind of a good kind of time frame because there are those who have it you know, more severely early on that a few months of recovery is not unexpected from. And then if there's a lot of multidisciplinary, multi-system issues, you know, that's something that we really think about and we try to integrate the care between them. Right. And, and so I think that's one of the unique aspects of, of your center is bringing in these different areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to... Yeah, go ahead. No, no, and go ahead. We, we really kind of focus on our clinic too and kind of tracking our data and tracking our patients and seeing kind of how things change over time. Uh, there's a lot of research projects that are kind of integrated in our clinic. Um, and you, we try to make sure that patients that we see that have these complaints are also hooked up with the scientists at Penn who are trying to answer questions about uh, post-COVID and post-COVID syndrome. Right. So, so when, you know, when we're looking at, you know, how might a cardiologist work with a patient versus how might a pulmonologist work with a patient? Uh, so just as an example, so patients with, who've had COVID and who are having lingering symptoms, we do know that cardiac manifestations, cardiac scarring, cardiac injury is not uncommon in that population. So the primary, the majority of patients that we do see that have any type of concern for ongoing respiratory or cardiac symptoms, uh, do undergo pretty standardized screening with different uh, testing. Uh, and we have one of our cardiologists who are kind of our lead post-COVID uh, cardiologist who's looking at all that data and looking at test results and kind of giving us the next steps. Uh, and our pulmonologists kind of do a really good job of one, treating symptoms, and then two, kind of helping to frame and classify what what's to be expected and what kind of uh, cohort the patients fall into uh, to allow for appropriate treatment. So are you somebody who has cardiac scarring or cardiac injury, uh, me, pulmonary lung scarring, lung injury that uh, is likely to be in that prolonged recovery or your lungs actually look pretty healthy. So we don't necessarily know what kind of the next steps will be. So let's do these therapy, let's do these symptomatic management, let's get you to the right testing, whatever that whatever that looks like. Right. So really looking at different different systems in the body and thinking about how do we best treat each one, but also how we how we treat them together. Yes, exactly. So uh, as we think, as we look forward, um, are there any particular drugs or therapies that you have your eye on in terms of hopefully leading to better outcomes? Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of, in terms of from like post-COVID patients and patients kind of in that chronic stage, yeah. Yeah. So I don't think we have a lot of evidence now to suggest there's one drug or treatment that's helpful. I think a lot depends on the symptoms people are having. There's a lot of things anecdotally that people are recommending in terms you know, that people hear about in terms of antihistamines, you know, Pepsid, uh, Claritin, things like that. I haven't seen any yeah. evidence yet to suggest those things are effective, but also you know, I think there are kind of low hanging fruits if patients are having symptoms that might be related to chronic nasal congestion or reflux to trying some of those medications too. So the jury's still out on, on a lot of those. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think we don't have any evidence for any specific drugs for generalized post COVID. We have things that we can try for specific symptoms, fatigue, malaise, insomnia, but there's no global treatment. 
and again, I think that goes back to not really understanding what's going on with these patients and why they're having these symptoms. Until we kind of have that figured out, it's gonna be hard to create a treatment to, to target those. Right. So the la- if I want to kind of end with, again, this, this coming back to this bigger picture is, you know, for those of us who are trying to communicate the science behind this and, and, and broaden people's awareness, uh, is there a better way that we should be talking about COVID to, to encompass um, this, this long-term aspect of the disease? Yeah, I, I think it's really just important to recognize that it's not, like you mentioned earlier, it's not just patients who live and die from it, that there's a spectrum of acute illness and there's a spectrum of chronic illness and ongoing manifestations. And even if we get a vaccine in the next, you know, three, three, four months, I think we're going to have still see a lot of the shadows of the big surges that we had early on moving forward, likely for, for months, probably for years. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty convinced about that. So I, I think it's, and I think a lot of our attention should then not just kind of evaporate, but kind of change to how do we have these, how do we best help these patients with kind of the long-term effects? And I think, you know, the, un, you know, the unfortunate reality is, you know, the more people who get it, the more stories we'll be hearing. Uh, yeah. And so trying to then take those individual stories and make some kind of sense out of what those patterns are, right? Yeah, exactly. So... Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks to everybody listening in for, for your questions. Um, I think, you know, the the only thing that we can, I think, take for granted is that the, our, our knowledge is continuing to change here. You know, whether it's, you know, how the vaccine will progress, whether it's, you know, how to best treat, uh, you know, patients that, that you're seeing with these, you know, complex systemic effects, um, there's still so much to learn. Uh, and so I hope that, you know, we'll, we'll continue to, to, to be a place where, where you can come and, and, you know, come to learn with us. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thanks for, ha- thanks for coming on today, Ben. Uh, you know, we're, we'll, you know, definitely uh, put a link in the chat to, to the COVID-19 recovery clinic as a resource that, that people can, can look at. Um, and we really appreciate the work that you're doing. Well, thank you for having me. I think this is you know, a really exciting series that you guys are hosting. Definitely have somebody on to talk about the vaccine once it uh, comes a little bit further along, uh, infectious disease or immunologist to kind of help with uh, answering some of those questions. And um, I'm not, obviously, I'm very happy to answer any questions. So if you know, want to send me a list or anything, we can post it, uh, any outstanding questions. Um, we can Sounds great. That. Thanks so much. And thanks to everybody for joining us. We'll see you next month. Thank Take you care. Guys.